At any rate, we're going to begin taking a look now at the occult origins of Nazism, the occult connections of Nazism, and we're going to evaluate that against some of the occult inclinations of the New Age in, quote, unquote, in the United States. Very important, very excellent book. The best book, in my opinion, on the occult connections of Nazism is a book called Gods and Beasts. Gods and Beasts is authored by a woman, and I believe it's a woman, I'm not positive, named Dusty Sklar, last name S-K-L-A-R. And it's published in hardcover by Thomas Y. Crowell and Company, and uh, copyrighted 1977. And in this, uh, this is an excellent book, and it compares the contemporary cult activity and occult inclinations with Nazism itself, and points out that Nazism essentially grew out of cults, and it uh, relates in a very important, relevant, and terrifying way the contemporary occult climate with that uh, that gave rise to Nazism. Reading now from Gods and Beasts by Dusty Sklar. The Holocaust appeared in a new light when I began some time ago to investigate certain modern esoteric cults making claims to paranormal knowledge. These cults, from those connected with George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, and Rudolf Steiner to their present reincarnations, shared certain features, an authoritarian obedience to a charismatic and messianic leader, secrecy, loyalty to the group above all other ties, a belief in supernatural possibilities open to the members only, a belief in reincarnation, initiation into superhuman sources of power, literal acceptance of the myth of ancient giants, unquote, or supermen who handed down an oral tradition to a chosen people and were guiding us now and in uncommon cases, satanic practices. Glaring parallels to Nazi history. Turning back to that history and its antecedents, I saw unmistakable evidence of a direct relationship between the Nazis and occultism. In fact, it was hard not to see it. Here was the missing link in our understanding of the beasts who proclaimed themselves gods. If it seems too fantastic to believe that one of the most civilized societies in the world should have fallen to occultism, here is a highly respected German historian, an exiled former staff member of the liberal newspaper Frankfurter Zeitung, Konrad Haydn, observing in his introduction to the memoirs of Dr. Felix Kirsten, Heinrich Himmler's masseur, that among the Germans, quote, the best of them found refuge from the despair of their daily life in a perverse fanaticism called the mysticism of a political movement, unquote. Germany was the perfect place for this development. In almost no other country were so many miracles, unquote, performed, so many ghosts conjured, so many illnesses cured by magnetism, so many horoscopes read between the two world wars. A veritable mania of superstition had seized the country, and all those who made a living by exploiting human stupidity thought that the millennium had come. General Erich Ludendorff, who had commanded the German armies in World War I, tried to make gold with the assistance of a swindler boasting the appropriate name of Tausend, meaning thousand. There was scarcely a folly in natural or world history to which the great general did not lend credence. When the German Republic, which he hated so intensely, had the barriers of the railway crossings painted red and white for better visibility, Ludendorff declared that the Jews in the government were doing this because Moses had led the Jews through the desert under these colors. Another high-ranking general was convinced that he possessed the secret of the death ray and that he could halt airplanes in their flight and stop tanks in their tracks. A steamship company dismissed its managing director because his handwriting had displeased a graphologist. Motorists avoided a certain road between Hamburg and Bremen because it was rumored from milestone number 113 there emanated certain mysterious terrestrial rays, unquote, which provoked one accident after another. A miracle worker who had the faculty of making the dead Bismarck appear during his mass meetings and who healed the sick by application of white cheese had enough followers to establish a city. Another crackpot was almost elected to the Reichstag. And still a third, who also barely missed election, promised to perform the greatest miracle of all by undoing the German inflation that had depreciated the mark to the value of one trillion paper marks for one gold mark. And skipping down... Other historians have corroborated that Germany between the two world wars was particularly ripe for these states of mind. It was a time of alienation and impotence. World War I had turned everything inside out. Apart from the physical devastations, the three bugbears of taxation, inflation, and confiscation sapped the strength of the middle class. The war itself was but a symptom of growing inner turbulence in Europe. The trouble had, of course, begun much earlier. In Germany particularly, the gap between an advancing technology and an outmoded social order was great. In the years preceding World War I, the German Jews were in an especially vulnerable position. The full emancipation of the German Jews, which had come in 1871, brought large numbers of Eastern European Jews to Germany. They settled in the cities, taking a prominent part in commercial, cultural, and political life. 
Likewise, the period from 1857 to 1910 saw a rise in the Jewish population of Vienna of more than 400%. Because of the high value the Jews placed on learning, a disproportionately large number went into the medical and legal professions, trying in that way to gain a modicum of social acceptance. Some Germans, of course, mistook these professionals for the average Jew. Slowly, a new religion evolved for those Germans who felt somehow cheated, a cult of race based on the supremacy of the Aryans and the vilification of the Jews. It was called the Volkisch, or Pan-German movement, and it enjoyed great popular appeal. It began a virulent campaign against the foreign element, unquote. A racial theory of history was developed, and it heralded the coming of a new messiah. The mystical concepts of Reich and Volk went along with an awakening interest in occultism. Secret cults sprang up, anti-Semitic and nationalistic, running like a sewer beneath Vienna and other cultural centers. Two Austrian occultists, Jörg Lang von Liebenfels and Guido von Liszt, attracted, presented an irrational, pseudo-anthropological package which attracted a number of wealthy backers, despite its foolishness. Lanz's Order of New Templars and Liszt's Arman and A-R-M-A-N-E-N boasted several influential members. In 1909, young Adolf Hitler, down and out in Vienna, came across Lanz's magazine Ostara, O-S-T-A-R-A, and made contact with the occultist. The erotic language and racist rantings of this magazine were remarkably similar to Hitler's later utterances. Membership in occult groups was often interlocking. When in 1912 a new secret cult, the Germanen Orden, was born, disciples of both Lanz and Liszt joined. The Germanen Orden was like other occult racist nationalist groups, but with a difference. It called for courageous men, unquote, to accomplish the work, unquote, of combating the social democrats who had gained ground in the election of 1912. Courageous men did not leap forth to join the Germanen Orden, but after World War I, prospects were brighter. People were in a state of shock over the German defeat, which had brought with it the collapse of Kaiser Wilhelm II's regime. Power was suddenly thrust into the hands of a provisional democratic government, whose unenviable task it was to accept the consequences of a lost war, reluctantly surrender, and sign a peace treaty. Extremists of the left and right blamed everything on this government. Germany's humiliation, as well as the reparations which bore heavily, financially, and psychologically on the people. It was the end of an era. The Germans had gone into the war with such high hopes. The war was to have been a release from care, a cleansing of mounting economic and social problems, a purging and purification. When the war began, said one German, quote, it was as if a nightmare had vanished, as if a door had opened and an old yearning had been satisfied, unquote. Again, quoting, the idea of war itself had become beautiful. It was to give people back their lives. Peace, as someone pointed out, had become insupportable, end quote. Hitler embodied the alienated man Hitler embodied the alienated man with no family or occupation to whom the outbreak of World War I was a godsend. He later confessed, quote, For me, as for every German, there now began the greatest and most unforgettable time of my earthly existence. Unquote. When the Germans signed the peace treaty, the army released almost a quarter of a million men to add their numbers to the growing ranks of the unemployed. Many soldiers were dazed to come home to a fatherland on the edge of anarchy, hungry, and undisciplined. The new Russian Revolution threatened to spill over into Germany. In Munich, particularly, communists stalked the, st stalked the streets, threatening civil war. Conservatives and liberals alike were anxious to do anything to stave off communism. And interrupting now, uh, Dusty Sklar gets into the Tula Society, one of the organ or the Tula Gesellschaft, one of the uh, organizations touted by uh, Michael Aquino, and one of the occult one of the pan-German occult groups that gave rise to the Nazi party. By the way, in this discussion of Nazism and the occult, I'm not going to try to avoid as much as possible getting immersed in the actual philosophy itself, which is uh, difficult at, at best to understand, and uh, as I say, I don't believe in the occult, so rather than wander endlessly through that, that nonsensical candy house, I'm simply going to present the connections of these groups to Nazism. The, the philosophies themselves are very difficult to understand, and uh, as I say, they're, they're fantastic in nature. But of the Germanen Orden and its uh, intersection with the Tula Society and the Tula Society's uh, intersection with the Nazi Party, Dusty Sklar writes as follows. The Germanen Orden was happy to merge its destiny with a Munich group called the Tula Society, that's T-H-U-L-E, which was meeting regularly to study the supposed occult meaning of the ancient Germanic alphabet and its symbolism. It was led by an astrologer who called himself Baron Rudolf von Sabatendorf. The Tula Society soon became the political arm of the Germanen Orden, and quietly set about preparing for a counter-revolution against the government. It formed an umbrella for many of the racist nationalist groups and enlisted frightened or unscrupulous men against the government which, it said, had betrayed the German people. In addition to rabid anti-Semitism, 
It preached the coming of a Fuhrer who would do away with hated democracy, the handmaiden of the weak. It began to collect weapons, bought a newspaper, instigated terrorist activity, and stirred up race hatred against the Jews, all the while keeping up the front of being a study group for German antiquity, Germanic antiquity. Tula members who were to play key roles in the formation of the Nazi party were Alfred Rosenberg, Rudolf Hess, Gottfried Fader, Karl Harrer, H-A-R-R-E-R, and Dietrich Eckert, E-C-K-A-R-T. Not until they found their Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler, were they able to carry out the irrational programs of Lanz, Liszt, and Sabatendorf. But all the essential ingredients, the ideology, the rituals, the symbols, the attitudes of the coming Nazi revolution, were already present in the Germanen Orden and the Tula Society, as well as the Order of the New Templars and the Armanen. So again, that is one of the uh, organizations touted by Michael Aquino in the Temple of Set. Now, we're going to digress slightly from the actual hard, hard connections of occultism to Nazism in order to fill in some information about Aleister Crowley. We're doing this because of the, some of the offshoots of Aleister Crowley's OTO organization, in fact, are intimately linked with the process umbrella cult. And so, uh, now, again, I'm not going to bother trying to explain the philosophies of a lot of these groups, but... Uh, it's it's worth thinking about them and uh, the 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 hard political connections of these groups to the Nazi Party. Now, one of the key names here uh, that we're going to go into is uh, a name of Karl Haushofer. Now, Karl Haushofer was a pan-German occultist and the originator of Nazi geopolitics. He had a key key influence on Hitler's thinking. We're going to go into Haushofer himself. However, here before we go into Haushofer's situation himself, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the intersection of occult groups which Haushofer was part of, and these also will intersect with Aleister Crowley. Again, reading from Gods and Beasts by Dusty Sklar. Powell's, Brennan, and Touts have linked Haushofer's name with another esoteric group, the Vril Society, or Luminous Lodge, a secret community of occultists in pre-Nazi Berlin. Vril, V-R-I-L, derives from the novel The Coming Race, which has prophetic overtones. It was written by an English occultist who is better known as the author of The Last Days of Pompeii, Baron Edward Bulwer-Lytton. Written in the 19th century, The Coming Race details a superhuman subterranean race of beings living in huge caves in the bowels of the earth who have developed a kind of psychic energy, Vril, with which they are made the equals of the gods. They plan one day to take control of the earth and bring about a mutation among the existing human elite, subjugating, sub subjugating of course, the rest of slavish humanity. Baron Lytton himself presumably believed that he was a storer of Vril. He practiced ceremonial magic and was claimed by Madame Blavatsky to be a theosophist. Although he had examined mesmerism, he denied that Vril had anything to do with animal magnetism. It was electricity whose properties were the same as, quote, the one great fluid, unquote, with which all of life was pervaded. His Vril people, unquote, accumulated it through mental and physical exercises resembling yoga. The Vril Society in Berlin apparently sought connection with the supernatural beings in the center of the world and practiced the techniques which would eventually strengthen their mastery of the divine energy so that they would have power over others and, other, and over events. They believed that this attempt at mastery was the only thing which gave purpose to existence. Any other activity was meaningless. One day, when the world was transformed, the beings in the center of the earth would emerge and form an alliance with those initiates who had succeeded in adequately preparing themselves. The Berlin Vril Society was in close contact with an English group known as the Golden Dawn Society, which was, for a time, headed by the Satanist Aleister Crowley and counted among its members such illustrious people as the poet William Butler Yeats. The Golden Dawn Society created an even more exclusive inner group than its competitors, the Theosophists, with admission by invitation only, ruled by secret chiefs who were discarnate spirits existing only in the astral plane, the practice of ritual magic, and the use of meeting rooms unknown to outer order members. Such elitism made it the prototype of other magical groups throughout the continent. I would interrupt, again, this, this uh, philosophy here is not to be taken at face value. They're simply explain a dusty sclar here is simply explaining the intersection of these various groups. The swastika was a key symbol to Golden Dawn, as it had been to Madame Blavatsky. She had incorporated it into a magical brooch which she wore. Aleister Crowley had written about it in a tract published in 1910, and he later claimed that the Nazis had stolen the sacred swastika from him. Now, again, I mention Aleister Crowley here, because although not directly connected to Nazism, he was a Satanist, and there are many people... His milieu, the Golden Dawn Society, intersects with the Vril Society, one of the Vril Society's members, Karl Haushofer, who we're going to go into a second, in a second. Again, I mentioned the Crowley connection because of the intersection between Crowley's OTO and the process umbrella cult implicated in the ultimate evil. 
More now about Aleister Crowley, reading now from a book called The Messengers of Deception, subcon- subtitled UFO Contacts and Cults. It's authored by a man named Jacques Vallée, last name V-A-L-L-E-E, who was a former director of information systems right down the road at Stanford, by the way. It's published in soft cover by Bantam Books, copyrighted, 1970, copyrighted 1979 and 1980 by Jacques Vallée. Now, we're not going to go into the flying saucer cults here, at least not at this juncture. I'm sure we will in the future. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, Vallée here, without dealing with the question of what flying saucers are or aren't, has gone into the flying saucer cults. Vallée himself does not believe in men from outer space any more than I do. He, however, has noted the phenomenon of UFO cults and specifically noticed their totalitarian and explicitly Nazi leanings, or the, the, the totalitarian and explicitly Nazi leanings of many of these UFO cults. So we're not going to go into the UFO cults, but we are going to talk a little bit here about Aleister Crowley, and Aleister Crowley himself, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, had intelligence connections. Reading from the Messengers of Deception by Jacques Vallée. This history of the interaction between flying saucer contact and politics goes way back to the early California contactees. Contactees is in quotes. In those days, many occult groups linked to power-hungry organizations were extremely active. Right after World War II, when a branch of Aleister Crowley's OTO flourished in Los Angeles, two of the most ardent members were Jack W. Parsons, a propulsion engineer, and L. Ron Hubbard, a science fiction buff. Jack Parsons met a Venusian, unquote, in the desert in 1946, and went on to be one of the founders of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and of the Aerojet Corporation. And in a footnote to the passage I just read you, talking about the Aleister Crowley's OTO, which again, elements of which intersect with the process, Ordo Templi Orientis. Aleister Crowley, by the way, was himself a minor espionage figure. His file at the intelligence service is said to have read, quote, use only with the most extreme caution, unquote. And uh, then he goes on to say, Crowley's influence on Hitler was more imaginary than real. And again, I mentioned this, uh, we're not going to go into the UFO cults at this point, although I think that's very important, and we probably will in the future, But because uh, they're explicitly Nazi, uh, many of them. But again, this is by way of linking Aleister Crowley up with the Vril Society and some of the, the occult milieu, which gave rise to some of the pan-German occult groups, which gave, in turn gave rise to Nazism. Now, the Vril Society, and it's inter- oh, by the way, it's interesting that the, the Golden Dawn, in addition to Aleister Crowley, numbered among its members the poet William Butler Yeats. Yeats himself went on to become an explicit fascist. Specifically, he, grew, he joined an Irish fascist group called the Celtic Twilight and was very closely affiliated with them. So it's worth contemplating here. Now, the reason we went into the intersection between the Vril Society and the Golden Dawn is the fact that the Vril Society was reported to have among its members a man named Karl Haushofer. And Karl Haushofer is a key, key occult link to Nazism, one of the most important. And uh, returning now to Gods and Beasts by Dusty Sklar. Uh, wait a second. Now, on second thought, uh, we'll, we'll hold... Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do this. We'll go into Karl Haushofer right now. I got a little bit out of order here uh, due to a little editing, but uh, about Karl Haushofer and his links to Nazism, and interestingly enough, a connection here to Anton LaVey. Uh, talking here of Hitler's imprisonment in Lonsberg Prison. Shared prison life served to bind the two men together until a later fiasco severed the bond. These two men, by the way, are Rudolf Hess and Adolf Hitler. Hess became Hitler's secretary and helped him with Mein Kampf. Hess did more than take dictation and type the manuscript. As the best educated of Hitler's disciples, he was able to provide Hitler with useful information, particularly on a new study which was called geopolitics. He introduced Hitler to the professor and ex-general from whom he had learned about geopolitics, and in fact, the professor was a frequent visitor to Lonsberg Prison. Repeating again, he here is Rudolf Hess. He introduced Hitler to the professor and ex-general from whom he had learned about geopolitics, and in fact, the professor was a frequent visitor to Lonsberg Prison. Some people indeed believe that the professor, Karl Haushofer, H-A-U-S-H-O-F-E-R, was Hitler's guiding brain. Writing in Current History and Forum in June of 1941, Frederick Sondern, S-O-N-D-E-R-N, who had personal knowledge of the subject, reported, quote, Dr. Haushofer and his men dominate Hitler's thinking. That domination began 17 years ago when the World War, when the World War General flattered the ex-corporal by, by paying him visits in prison. Haushofer saw possibilities in the hysterical agitator who had launched an unsuccessful beer hall revolution. The prison visits became more frequent. The distinguished soldier scientist fascinated Hitler, then finally made him a disciple. The ascendancy has grown as Dr. Haushofer again and again has proved the accuracy of his knowledge and the wisdom of his advice. 
It was Hossofer who taught the hysterical, planless agitator in a Munich jail to think in terms of continents and empires. Hossofer virtually dictated the famous Chapter 16 of Mein Kampf, which outlined the foreign policy Hitler has since followed to the letter. Hossofer's Lebensraum, or living space theory, sought to justify Germany's world conquest by claiming that it was necessary to ensure the German people room to preserve and expand their racial community. He developed an intelligence-gathering organization which became the envy and model for all others. He was called everything from Hitler's idea man to, quote, the man who will in the end take the Fuhrer's place, unquote. Yet he seems to have kept a very low profile. But there is apparently much more to Hosshofer than the geopolitician. A love affair with the Orient began in 1908 when, as a field artillery officer in the Bavarian Army, he was sent to Tokyo to study the Japanese Army and to advise it as an artillery instructor. The assignment changed the course of his life. He traveled extensively in the Far East and added Chinese, Ch Japanese, and Korean languages to his repertoire of English. No, excuse me. The assignment changed the course of his life. He traveled extensively in the Far East and added the Japanese, Chinese, and Korean languages to his repertoire of English, French, and Russian. He could not be accused, as other leading Nazis were, of having a provincial background. His four-year sojourn in the Far East also changed the course of German history. Hosshofer was able to make the acquaintance of influential Japanese and to develop a rapport for their culture which helped account for the German-Japanese alliance. When he returned to Germany in 1912, he had no reason at all to know that the Chinese proverb of which he was so fond, he who rides a tiger cannot get off, unquote, would one day have particular relevance for him. Hosshofer was introduced to Oriental teachings during his, during his stay in the Far East. He had been a devout student of Schopenhauer, and now he could drink directly from the same source. He became sufficiently conversant in Sanskrit to translate several Hindu and Buddhist texts, and according to Ravenscroft, he was, quote, an authority on Oriental mysticism, concealing the other side of his nature and activities as a leader of a secret community of initiates and an authority on every aspect of the secret doctrine, unquote. He was in the esoteric stream of Satanism, through which he sought to raise Germany to the pinnacle of world power. Repeating that last sentence, he was in the esoteric stream of Satanism through which he sought to raise Germany to the pinnacle of world power. And then Sklar interjects, The king of Satanists in America today is Anton LaVey, a former circus lion tamer who greatly admires the Nazis. LaVey's book, The Satanic Bible, published in 1969, is dedicated to a puzzling mixture of people, with one entry reading, quote, To Karl Hosshofer, a teacher without a classroom. So the Hosshofer connection here is, is very interesting indeed. Now, one, a couple of the uh, other aspects of Nazism and occultism that we're going to go into here involve uh, Heinrich Himmler, his uh, SS rituals, the rituals that were done in the so-called Ordensburg and the SS training castles. Uh, Michael Aquino was reported to, uh, widely reported to have performed one of those rituals. We're going to talk about Heinrich Himmler and his occult leanings. Uh, he himself was a, quote, spiritualist, unquote, as we're about to see. For the information on Himmler and the SS, we're going to turn to one of the books that Aquino recommends to his uh, Temple of Set followers, namely Hitler, the Occult Messiah. It's authored by Gerald Suster, or Suster, S-U-S-T-E-R, and it is published in hardcover, just one second, by the St. Martin's Press of New York, copyrighted 1981. Now, of Heinrich Himmler and his, quote, spirituality, unquote, and note, please, the quotes, uh, Gerald Suster writes as follows. In common with the vast majority of occultists, Himmler accepted the theory of reincarnation. At a speech made in Dachau in 1936, he informed high-ranking SS officers that they had all met before, in previous lives, and that after their present lives had ended, they would meet again. Himmler thought that he himself was the reincarnation of a 9th century personality, King Heinrich the Fowler, whom he also claimed as a distant ancestor. He revered the memory of the first of the Saxon kings who had defeated a Polish invasion from the east, and he referred to his tomb in Quedlingburg Castle as a sacred spot, unquote, to which we Germans make pilgrimage, unquote. In 1936, on the thousandth anniversary of King Heinrich's death, he swore a solemn oath to continue the Saxon monarch's civilizing mission in the east, unquote. On each subsequent anniversary, Himmler descended into the crypt and spent the night in meditation by the tomb, communing with the spirit of the dead king. It is difficult to see how Himmler could believe both that he was the reincarnation of King Heinrich I and that he could communicate with his spirit, but this contradiction does not appear to have troubled him. Perhaps he thought that he communed with an inner soul, unquote, like the Hindu Atman, which had inhabited the king's body and now inhabited himself, or else he did not feel the need for his beliefs to be coherent. 
Certainly he accepted the spirit world as a reality. To his masseur, Felix Kirsten, he boasted of his ability to call up spirits and converse with them. One of these spirits was that of King Heinrich I, with whom Himmler held long nighttime conversations. Such were the deepest beliefs of one of the most dreaded figures of the 20th century, who by 1942 was the second most powerful individual in the Third Reich. I'm going to repeat uh, the last couple of sentences here. Compare this with the Chandlers of today, quote, Chandlers, unquote. To his masseur, Felix Kirsten, he boasted of his ability to call up spirits and converse with them. One of these spirits was that of King Heinrich I, with whom Himmler held long nighttime conversations. And again, we're going to come back to the Chandlers, quote, unquote, a little later. Of the SS initiation ceremony, about which there's a lot of controversy, and again, bear in mind that uh, this ceremony was performed, uh, according to wide accounts, by Michael Aquino in an SS Ordensburg and at Wevelsburg Castle, Gerald's sister writes as follows in Hitler, the Occult Messiah. The Death's Head SS were given further training in the Burgs, in which they learned that, quote, the only living being that exists is the cosmos or universe. Everything else and all other beings, including man, are only the various forms which have been multiplied through the ages of the living universe, unquote. SS men were instructed in their glorious mission to create a new age, a new world, a new man, in cooperation with the evolution of the cosmos, and they swore vows which proclaimed their allegiance to, unquote, irreversible superhuman destimony, destiny, unquote. Powell's and Berger have commented upon this latter ceremony. Quote, those who, do not, those who know do not talk. There is no description in existence of the initiator... Let me begin again. Those who know do not talk. There is no description in existence of the initiatory ceremony in the Burgs, but it is known that such a ceremony took place. It was called the Ceremony of the Stifling Air, the allusion being to the extraordinarily tense atmosphere which prevailed until the vows had been pronounced. Some occultists, such as Louis Spence, believed that the ceremony included a black mass in the purest satanic tradition. On the other hand, Vidi Frieschauer, in his study of Himmler, interprets the stifling air as the moment when the participants were overcome by complete stupor, unquote. And then Suster goes on to say, The concept of stifling air reminds one of the respiratory difficulties experienced by Mathers and Hitler when in contact with the secret chiefs, unquote, and there is no doubt that this was a full-blooded magical ceremony. We do not know, however whether this ritual was at all similar to the ceremony of the stifling air allegedly practiced by the, knights, the, by the medieval Knights Templar, or to that celebrated today by the Church of Satan in San Francisco. The latter can be found in the satanic rituals by the master of the modern Church of Satan, Anton Zandor LeVay. I'm going to read that last sentence again. We do not know, however, whether this ritual was at all similar to the ceremony of the stifling air allegedly practiced by the medieval Knights Templar, or to that celebrated today by the Church of Satan in San Francisco. The latter can be found in the satanic rituals by the master of the modern Church of Satan, Anton Zandor LeVay. Above the high-ranking initiates of the Death's Head Order sat the Grand Council of Knights. There were thirteen of them, the number of a witch's coven, and each one had achieved the rank of SS General or higher. At their head was the Grand Master Heinrich Himmler, whose personality proclaimed the peculiar union of the banal with the demonic the key to the mystery of National Socialism. And uh, still later, there's an eyewitness account of an SS meditation ceremony by uh, Walter Schellenberg, the head of the Siegerreitsdienst, the SS Intelligence Service, quoting, and this, this by the way, is this coven, the 13 Grand Council of Knights, 13 including Himmler. I witnessed for the first time some of the rather strange practices resorted to by Himmler through his inclinations toward mysticism. He assembled 12 of his most trusted SS leaders in a room, and ordered them all to concentrate their minds on exerting a suggestive influence. I happened to come into the room by accident and to see these twelve SS leaders sitting in a circle, all sunk in deep and silent contemplation, was indeed a remarkable sight. Each knight had to devote himself to a ritual of spiritual exercises aimed mainly at concentration, the equivalent of prayer, before discussing the higher policy of the SS. And again, as with the dedication to Karl Haushofer, the teacher without a classroom, there is a strong link here between the occult elements of Nazism and Anton Zandor LeVay, the founder of the Church of Satan in San Francisco, the fellow who uh, gave rise to Michael Aquino's career as the, quote, Antichrist, unquote. Now, in, a, in the Chronicle article of November 3rd, we also saw a reference to something called the Ananerba. And we're going to talk about the Ananerba right now. It was incorrectly described in that article as a fanatic Aryan group which existed before and during Hitler. It was fanatic, and it was Aryan, but it specifically was the Ancestry Research Bureau of the SS. Returning to Gods and Beasts by Dusty Sklar. 
By the way here, the, the reference to Horbiger is a guy named Hans Horbiger, who was one other of the major occult influences on the Third Reich. Uh, I'm not even going to attempt to describe his philosophy. Suffice it to say, he felt the entire universe was an interplay of, uh, between fire and ice. His, his uh, theory was called the Eternal Ice Theory. It, it was adopted by the Nazis. Dusty Sklar writes here, of the formation of the Ananerba, by the way, again, that's A-H-N-E-N-E-R-B-E, -E -E, Horbiger died in 1931 before he could see some of the consequences of his dogma. Hitler youth were recruited to spread the word. In 1935, Heinrich Himmler, an admirer, established the Ananerba, the ancestral research branch of the SS, for the purpose of subsidizing researches into occult theories of ancestral origins of Aryanism. He sent the German playwright Edmund Kiss to Abyssinia to look for supporting evidence of Horbiger's theories and made another Horbiger disciple, Dr. Hans Robert Schultetus, S-C-U-L-T-E-T-U-S, head of the Ananerba branch, which was to concentrate on weather forecasts, resting on the world ice cosmology. Literature about this cosmology was handed out freely to high-ranking Nazis. A German exhibition to Tibet tried to, find fo tried to find fossilized remains of giants. Anyone who attacked Horbiger was promptly suppressed by the Ananerba. And again, that would, uh, Horbiger was one of the occult influences and his ideas adopted by the Nazis. Sklar writes uh, still later about the Ananerba as follows. About the Nazi researches into occultism, the most ambitious researches were done by the Ananerba, which had a group of financiers called the Circle of Friends, led by Wilhelm Kepler, pay enormous sums for a flight to Tibet to look for traces of a pure Germanic race which might have been able to keep intact the ancient Nordic mysteries. The Ananerba also had archaeologists digging up all of Europe for remains of Germanic culture. More than 50 departments in this branch succeeded in spending over a million marks on such vital, unquote, matters. So that, again, is the reference to the Ananerba, and uh, that, again, that's another of the many Nazi occult elements which uh, Michael Aquino espoused and uh, recommended to his followers. We're going to uh, take another musical break now, then we're going to come back for the last installment of the prepared portion of the broadcast. We should have time for maybe a half hour of phone calls at the end of the broadcast. But again, we're going to take another musical break, and then we will be back for the conclusion of our broadcast this evening. We're going to return now to our discussion of the occult and Nazism and Satanism and Nazism, and we're going to deal uh, briefly here with some very, very important insights by Dusty Sklar in her book, Gods and Beasts. Specifically, I think Sklar has achieved a major, major breakthrough here by observing the continuity between the cult and occult activity in contemporary America and the occultism which gave rise to Nazism, which we've already talked about. In the last chapter of Gods and Beasts, she writes as follows. No doubt, some cults really do help some people. They are frightening nonetheless. Occultists themselves are frightened. The hypnotic effect is powerful whatever the quality of the particular leader or doctrine. When we remember that the Nazi party arose out of the merger of mystical groups, there is cause for even more distress. These groups considered themselves sacred. Faith in a holy cause had taken possession of them. They were completely incapable of objectivity. What they did was not seen by many of them as evil. This pathological blindness convinced them that they were participating in the superhuman task of ridding the world of a menace. And still later, actually a little earlier in that chapter, she goes on to forecast, basically, that unless there's a change, we are going to see the same thing happening in America. And again, I think her perception here is a breakthrough of the continuity between the occultism and cultism currently afflicting America and the same situation in Weimar, Germany, that gave rise to Nazism. Again, returning to Gods and Beasts by Dusty Sklar. Men who are ignorant of history may be condemned to repeat its lessons, as the American philosopher George Santayana observed. But the reverse is true, too. We often need the experience of the present to shed light on the events of the past so that we are better able to guide our lives in the future. If we are to ask now, more than a generation later, how normal people could have committed the Nazi atrocities, we need only look at the normal people in American cults today. This may seem a harsh comparison. The parallels are certainly not universally applicable. Still, it would not be unfair to say that the same sort of normal people who obey the crazy commands of the Nazi hierarchy are today obeying the crazy commands of some contemporary cult leaders. To be sure, these commands, apart from certain satanic cults, do not call for ritual murder. Not yet, at any rate. But none of us should feel too comfortable with so many of our compatriots so willing to suspend independent judgment 
and so ill-equipped to exercise that judgment. Membership in occult groups in America today has reached epidemic proportions. Some people take this as an omen that Satan is hard at work, others that God is. The groups take many different forms, Satanism, witchcraft, pseudoscience, mind control, mysticism, Christian, and pagan. Most are not as innocent as they seem as we're beginning to find out. The one which has most often been compared with the Nazis is, of course, the Charles Manson cult with its murderous violence and sadomasochistic sex. All the satanic groups express a great admiration for Hitler. Anton LaVey, the leader of the Church of Satan, probably has the largest collection of Nazi memorabilia in America. LaVey dedicated his book, The Satanic Bible, to a number of people, including the Nazi geopolitician Karl Haushofer, a teacher without a classroom, unquote. In the case of other groups, there are less obvious parallels. The Reverend Sun Myung Moon came from Korea to save tens of thousands of American youth who hail him as the Messiah. In gratitude, they have left their families to give their energies totally to his unification church. We've spoken about LeVay, and we've also spoken at great length about uh, the, the unification church and intelligence front with direct links going back to Japanese fascism. Interestingly enough, uh, Dusty Sklar concludes her book with a description of a parent's demonstration uh, parents of children that had been hooked up with the Moonies and they were demonstrating against the Unification Church. She concludes her book, The parents at the protest rally, determined to get their children back, paraded placards which read, Remember Hitler. No more Hitlers. Stop Moon. Moon is destroying America's youth. Aren't they taking themselves too seriously, one reporter asked. Moon's group seems so innocuous. The Hitler youth began by raising money, selling flowers and candy most aggressively. Parents in Germany must have felt this way about their kids, I answered, and with good reason. And again, I think Sklar's insight here of the continuity between cults and occultism in today and in Weimar Germany and the rise of Nazism is absolutely brilliant and an essential, essential insight for us if we're to avoid a repetition of the past. And if people think that a repetition of the past is so far gone, I'd like to read you an article which, as I said at the top of the broadcast, would be genuinely funny if it wasn't so tragic. As uh, Goethe remarked, nothing is more tragic than ignorance in action. Reading now from the San Francisco Chronicle of Tuesday, October 27th of 1987. It's an article about these, quote, channelers, unquote, by Paul Liberatore, L-I-B-E-R-A-T-O-R-E. -E. It's headlined, Channeling's Crowded Aura. Where did it subheaded, where did all these dead people come from? Jay-Z Knight is afraid she may get run over by the spiritual trend she helped create. The glamorous knight is a superstar trance channel, unquote, the new age term for a spiritual medium. Thousands of her followers believe that Ramtha, a 35,000-year-old warrior spirit from Atlanta, speaks the wisdom of the ages through her. Skipping down, but not every thread of controversy is a laughing matter to her. The 41-year-old former cable TV executive recently shocked a national TV audience with an appearance on ABC's 2020, arguing as herself that there was no such thing as right and wrong and leaving the impression that she condoned murder. That caused a lot of difficulties in my family, she said, claiming that her remarks were taken out of context. Even though it was devastating and I lost a lot of friends, it was really a wonderful experience. It drew out my integrity, unquote. In 1977, according to Knight, Ramtha, the Enlightened One, first appeared in the doorway of her kitchen in Tacoma, Washington, as a nine-foot-tall transparent entity lit up like a Christmas tree. He was huge, made of light, with bronze skin, eyes like ebony, quote, a fine chiseled nose and a broad jawline and a smile that would rival any Hollywood stars, unquote. She wrote in her just-released autobiography, A State of Mind. Since then, she has parlayed the hunky ram into a small fortune, channeling him in seminars, private consultations, tapes and books, always for a considerable fee. When the ram appears through her, Knight roars his stilted English in a manly baritone and jerks and stomps around like a gladiator on speed. Ram says, indeed, and so be it, a lot, but lately he's been loosening up. He recently said, yes, Knight said. Knight said she, could ne she would never make up a 35,000-year-old Cro-Magnon just to be famous, which can often be a pain. Get real, she said. But she can't complain about the money. She recently built a $1.5 million mansion outside Seattle where she lives with her third husband, Jeff, a young cowboy she set up in the quarter horse business. As the first channel to become a celebrity, she has sparked a national phenomenon. Now she may be a victim of her own success. With more and more people, many of them upscale types, seeking the advice and counsel of so-called higher beings such as Ramtha, 
channeling has exploded into a $400 million business, according to one estimate. Psychics channeling spirits with names like Zoran and the Space Brothers are coming out of the cosmic woodwork. There are even schools and classes to teach ordinary people how to channel their own spirit guides to lead them through life in the pressurized 80s. The competition has Jay-Z Knight worried about her future. People want to be channeled. People who want to be channels are missing the message, she said. Instead of emulating a trend, if they would just get in touch with themselves and realize that God is inside them, they'd be happy, unquote. But the channeling craze shows no signs of leveling off. Common Ground, a sort of New Age Yellow Pages, lists more than 30 professional channels in the Bay Area, and that is only the tip of the metaphysical iceberg. Now, suddenly there are zillions of channeling practitioners, said San Francisco-based psychic Kevin Ryerson, who received national attention in Shirley MacLaine's TV miniseries, Out on a Limb. He believes channeling and the New Age are a natural progression that began with the hippies in the 60s and gathered momentum during the human potential movement of the 70s. It's been a steadily growing phenomenon, he said. Ryerson, a 36-year-old former sign painter, channels two disembodied spirits, Tom McPherson, an Irishman from the Elizabethan era, and John, a 2,000-year-old Hebrew teacher whose sect wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Jack Purcell, a 40-year-old one-time insurance company executive, has already unseated Jay-Z Knight as the, new, as the hot new channel among the hip New Age crowd in California. On demand, Purcell, P-U-R-S-E-L, falls into a trance and supposedly conjures up a non-physical spirit entity named Lazarus, who speaks in a stiff British accent in which precise becomes precise and time comes out tyum. After eight years of working the guru circuit in Marin County, the bearded, bush-jacketed Purcell recently pulled up stakes and bought a house and office in Beverly Hills so he could be closer to his celebrity clientele, which includes Sharon Gless of the TV series Cagney and Lacey and Ted Danson, who plays bartender Sam Malone on Cheers. Purcell claims that Lazarus first came to him in 1973 while he was meditating in his hotel room before a business meeting. In the self-absorbed, success-crazed 80s, Purcell Lazarus has found an upscale audience for his soothing lectures on topics such as loving yourself and creating your own reality. Truth seekers are packing hotel ballrooms and auditoriums for seminars and workshops with the kindly Lazarus, which range in price from $275 for a weekend to $1,000 for a week. Because of the intense demand, some sessions are by invitation only. In personal consultations with clients, Lazarus dispenses advice on everything from careers and relationships to playing the stock market, losing weight, and picking the best pups from a litter of show dogs. Interrupting, now I know why the market crashed. Okay, returning to uh, the article. Lazarus is now hard at work writing a book. It doesn't let up, Purcell said. In his opinion, the New Age is part of the same spiritual awakening that sparked fundamentalist TV evangelism. Followers of both are looking for spiritual answers to mundane problems, he said. In a new book on the subject, John Klimo, K-L-I-M-O, a former Rutgers University professor now living in the Bay Area, defines channeling as, quote, a phenomenon in which otherwise ordinary people seem to let themselves be taken over by or in other ways receive messages from another, another personality who uses them as a conduit. Such personalities usually purport to be, for, usually purport, one second, we're going to make a couple of adjustments here. Here we go on the tape. Such personalities usually are purported to be from another dimension or level of reality, often claiming to be more highly evolved than we are, unquote. Critics accuse channelers of being frauds whose only real power is their uncanny ability to separate followers from their money. And in a sidebar article to that one, there's uh, an article called A New Church Where Old Voices Speak Out. In the Bay Area, the Berkeley Psychic Institute Church of Divine Man has graduated, unquote, 3,000 psychics, many of them channelers, according to its founder, Louis Bostwick, a 70-year-old former watchmaker and jeweler. 